goodness, you're all still here. Uh, I am so excited to be up here for this panel. Uh, our last panel, two days of big ideas and big topics, and there's no bigger topic right now than space. We have two fantastic guests to help us talk about what's happening in space entrepreneurship and what could be happening in space entrepreneurship. So let me bring them both out. Uh, the first is Pete Warden. Pete uh, runs NASA Ames Center, which is the big R&D facility for NASA in Silicon Valley. EU regulations. Uh, NASA Ames, for those of you who don't know, has about 2,500 employees, about an $800 million budget. It's right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Uh, they're doing a ton of interesting stuff with Google at the moment that we'll talk about. Uh, so Pete is one of the perfect people to help us uh, get at this issue. Uh, our other guest is Andy Aldrin, president of Moon Express. Uh, moon Express, for those of you who don't know, is uh, aiming to make the first private commercial flight to the moon in 2015. Wiggle. Wiggle room on that. Uh, but they're, they're building a spacecraft yep. that will uh, make the first private trip to the moon sometime soon. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and you're also based in Silicon, Silicon Valley. Valley. So, right. And I'm in ex-Silicon right Valley. Right Pete's Center. Yep. So, are, Pete's actually our landlord. Oh, great. We'll have a seat. Yep. Okay. I, I'm assuming those are beer bottles, correct? Yep. <laughs> um, Great. So, um, you know, I just want to start, uh, Pete, with you. Um, I described a little bit about NASA Ames, but for those, of the, for those here who don't know about it, can you describe it a little bit and just talk a little bit about um, uh, the transition that you've been taking it through? Well, uh, you know, NASA has been around since 1958, but uh, we had a predecessor agency uh, called the National Advisory Committee in Aeronautics, started in 1915. Uh, its job was to help develop uh, aeronautics industry, and uh, now NASA's job is to help develop uh, what I call the emerging space economy. Uh, we, being in the middle of Silicon Valley, are uh, kind of a key player in that. Uh, uh, but we do a couple other things, too, you know, like take people into space, and uh, uh, there's 10 centers at NASA. And we also uh, discover the secrets of the universe, uh, where to get a good beer. Uh, yes. <laughs> and is there life elsewhere in the universe? But, uh, but that's basically the mission. Uh, uh, this, by the way, is Ames' 75th year, uh, founded in 1939. Wow. We still have some of the same employees, so it's uh, kind of fun. Yeah. It's a fantastic place. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so Andy, yeah. talk a little bit about your role. You're, you're new-ish to new the company, role, so, so. so talk a little bit about your, your background and what Moon Express is doing. So Moon Express is a purely privately funded venture developing a new generation spacecraft that it, its first missions are going to be to go to the moon and then subsequently we're going to be doing a lot of in space transportation but lo so let me start by by rolling our shamelessly promotional video so if you could roll the video please that'll give you a little bit of an idea what it is we're trying to do there we go Space is going to be the next big industry. I suppose your company is getting me closer to the day when I might find myself on the moon. Moon is nothing but another continent from our perspective. Just like any other continent, we want to use that continent and the resources from there to make life better for all of us here. Bob Richards, CEO of a California startup called Moon Express, believes that the first trillionaires will come from space. I see the moon and the moon and soon I can see from the moon. We can now travel to other planets and bring resources back from there. Leading the world to space helped America achieve new heights of prosperity here on Earth. Using the ingenuity and cost effectiveness of private enterprise, we're going back. team have been designing unique landing gear and cutting-edge miniature radar systems. There's nothing new about getting to the moon. It's about doing it, applying innovation and disruptive technologies so small teams can do what only superpowers could do before. 
we will be sending robotic landers initially to the surface of the moon carrying scientific and commercial payloads. Then we'll get into the era of exploring for resources and learning how to process those resources and bringing them back to Earth. The moon, unlike Earth, has not been molten for four billion years. Okay, <laughs> so the things that hit have stayed on the surface and it doesn't wow. have that atmosphere to burn things up. I think there's more platinum on the moon than there is in all the mining reserves of planet Earth. The platinum, the rare earth elements, plus you have helium-3. That essentially you can use for fusion energy. Any small amount of helium-3 could provide energy for the whole planet for hundreds of years. So it is not just a fun project, it is also a great business. I just see it uh, as a beginning, an instant in history. We are those crazy people who think that every idea is a crazy idea until we make it happen and then people say, of course! So, so Chris, that's Moon Express. That's what we do. I've only been with the company now for a few months. The next yeah. version of the video, I promise you will have two things. You'll probably see my smiling face and we're going to substitute my dad for Neil on it. <laughs> um, but anyway, that kind of gives you an idea of the long-term vision of the company. Near term, as I said, we've got missions going to the moon, late 15, maybe 16. Um, after that, there are a whole host of, of in-space transportation activities that we can get into and talk about a little bit. Right. Um, we're real proud to be part of the new space economy, developing the economy. In many ways, I think what we are is kind of the, the first trucking business of the in-space economy. Yeah. So let's kind of expand on that for a second because you're kind of in the center of this ecosystem that, that um, Andy's talking about here. So talk a little bit more about what Ames is doing to kind of expand that. Well, well let me uh, kind of, I'll quickly run through a few uh, pictures here, but uh, uh, when we say an emerging space economy, I, I think it's a very broad thing and Moon Express is an important part, but uh, let me start with uh, the Earth. This is a picture of the Earth uh, recently, and all that stuff is uh, satellites, uh, and an increasing part of it is commercial. Uh, one of the big image, uh, industries, which you just heard about with uh, people like Planet Labs, who by the way used to work for me and now make a lot more money, uh, the, uh, are doing imaging uh, of the Earth and selling those images. Uh, this is a pretty important satellite. Uh, this is a government satellite, and it's an international satellite. Uh, the International Space Station, but it's now being used to do a lot of things, like uh, uh, we're resupplying it, although we had a little problem a few days ago, uh, but uh, we'll get through that one. Uh, and th there are two companies for a reason, because we had that problem. Uh, that's commercial. This is a really exciting thing that came out of an uh, effort at uh, Singularity University, which if you haven't heard of it, is a, uh, a, a startup factory, but it's more than that. It's uh, uh, right on Moffett Field along with Moon Express. Uh, they try to find things that can affect a billion people. And one of those has been manufacturing things in space from resources you find there. Two months ago they just launched the first uh, uh, 3D printer to the International Space Station. So it's called massless exploration. A really a, a, a growing economy. A few years ago they had three guys and now they got about 30. Uh, growing industry. Uh, this is a guy that's kind of interesting. This is Dennis Tito, the first space tourist. Uh, there's a growing tourism industry. Uh, as noted on, uh, on the Moon Express video, uh, pretty soon if you've got a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, which I'd have if, if uh, my family didn't <laughs> find out about it, uh, uh, you can go for a ride uh, suborbitally. Uh, the, uh, this is the most exciting thing, though, I think, is the development of really small, cheap satellites. And, you heard a lot about it again with uh, Planet Labs, but uh, you know when these things started 15 years ago, people said, hey look, this is stupid, they're just a toy. But now we can make a lot of money on them, we can do science, uh, and, and we're seeing an explosion 
in this for industry. Uh, this is Planet Labs. Uh, you know, they've, they've built now over a hundred of these things. Uh, you know, it used to be said, well, you couldn't do this. You couldn't mass produce cheap satellites. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, <clears throat> we can deploy these things from the International Space Station. So this device that governments built is now really helping us develop uh, industry. Uh, other ideas are to have global broadband. Uh, this, I think, is the next big thing that anywhere on the planet, uh, and this may involve thousands of satellites, uh, this is literally a trillion dollar industry that, that we think is going to take off here in the next few years. And we at NASA, part of our job is to help develop the technology and transition it. Uh, I'm a success if people like Planet Labs hire my people away, although I'm a little mad when they do it. <laughs> the, uh, uh, as we move out in space, there's uh, already a huge communications industry. There are several hundred communication satellites that allow point-to-point -point uh, communications today, virtually all long-range television and, and other systems come through these geosynchronous satellites. Uh, launch vehicles. Uh, now in the United States and around the world, many of the launch vehicles are commercial. This is already a uh, probably a uh, 20 or 30 billion dollar a year industry uh, and it's growing. Uh, these satellites are big, you know, so this is the opposite end of small commercial satellites. This is a commercial communication satellite, uh, uh, kind of a big thing. Now, the most important thing I think here is what, because I'm an astrophysicist and I uh, uh, really like the, you know, we're moving out into space. Moon Express has got its sights set on the moon and the, the moon has a lot of interesting resources. Now, in, in the video, uh, they talked about, you know, platinum and gold and and other things. I think that, you know, the most important thing on the moon is water. So this right here is going to be the first product, followed probably by beer. <laughs> you know, lunar beer will be pretty good, I, I hope. Uh, and Moon Express is the first company. But there are companies moving either further out. There's a lot of junk, that's a technical term, left over from the formation of the solar system, and these are called asteroids. Uh, they do good things and bad things. Uh, 65 million years ago, they uh, destroyed the dinosaurs. Uh, if they hadn't, we'd look a lot different here today. Uh, some people say I'd be better looking. Uh, but there's a lot of resources on these things. Uh, this is a, a small one, a few hundred meters in diameter, uh, that uh, Japanese spacecraft went to uh, a few years ago. Uh, and by the way, there's a lot of them. Uh, we're kind of in a cosmic shooting gallery. Uh, so not only is there interest in resources, but there's interest in protecting ourselves from them. Well, let me ask, hang on for yep. one second. Let me just uh, yep. ask Andy then, just to stay with yep. that theme for a second. So what does it take to, to do this stuff that he's talking about? What does it take for you guys to, building, to build the company in terms of finance, hmm. finances and talent? I mean, are you guys, where are you getting the money from? Is it the government? Is it venture capitalists? Are you doing Kickstarter campaigns? Yeah. So as I said, we're 100% commercially funded. We're funded on very much the Silicon Valley, so we've gone through an A round, a B round. We've raised about $15 million. We've got a few tens of millions of dollars left to finish our spacecraft development, but we think by early next year, we'll have all the funding in place to finish the development of the spacecraft. So we're actually beginning our flight testing program, doing landing tests in a couple of months. We'll actually we'll really start the first fires in, in a month or so. So we're moving very rapidly on it. So I think what we're talking about is a development program that's, that's literally ten, tens of millions of dollars at, as opposed to a traditional spacecraft which would be hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars. And so you ask how do you do that? And a lot of it has to do with um, actually building things and testing them rather than having thousands of engineers working on engineering it. We're actually gonna build three versions of the spacecraft and test them doing hover tests and other land tests before we actually integrate the final spacecraft. So I think that's one of the fundamentally different things about what we're doing in new space than, than what's being done in traditional aerospace. I mean, we're very much using the sort of uh, SpaceX model where we're developing most of the technologies in-house. There's very little that we're actually buying as a complete subsystem outside. And is this generally the model that you're seeing in terms, or does NASA, does the government have a role in the funding of this stuff as well? Well, there, it's really all the above, and, and, and I think it's important to understand there are two private sources. 
One of those are people that want to make money. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're seeing the standard investments from, from venture capitalists, from private individuals. The other one is an interesting one, though. It's, it's uh, philanthropic investment. Uh, you know, a few, uh, a few years ago, I asked a billionaire, and I won't tell you which one, that, uh, you know, what he was going to do with all of his money. And he said, well, you know, you get, you know, a few tens of billions, you know, what do you do? Well, you buy a big house and a yacht, maybe a couple airplanes and fast cars, and you might go through a couple spouses. And, uh, and the moon? Uh, but he says, then you want to know what, what you do with the other 19 and a half billion. And I think a lot of these people are interested in their legacy. And a lot of the, the scientific objectives, and we're seeing now not only people that want to make money, but people that want to leave a legacy. Uh, people like Elon Musk is interested in settling Mars. Uh, others are interested in settling the moon. Others are interested in building telescopes to see if we're alone in the universe. Uh, and in both of those, it's part of NASA's job in our charter to enable that, to provide technology support. And we're also a customer. You know, if uh, uh, once Andy goes to the moon, uh, we're going to buy buy time to ride on that and, uh, and maybe even it. pay for the whole mission. That's right. Uh, although, you know, you need to hold me to write a check. Yeah. <laughs> so if you look at our capital structure, the majority of the capital we've got right now are actually uh, large corporate institutional investors, companies that in some cases are $150, $160 billion market cap. There are, to be sure, perhaps some, um, we have a fair amount, a fair number of um, high net worth individuals that are investing in our company. But if you actually look at the dollars, most of it's coming from publicly traded companies and they are absolutely concerned about the bottom line and, and they, are, they believe very much and I think what's, what's a very solid business case that we've got behind us. But if they're high net worth individuals that, that want to invest for um, the historical value of it all, I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah. Now, is this stuff that we're describing, the stuff that's happening now, is this moving to a point where it's accessible for, say, the average entrepreneur who's sitting out in the audience today in terms of the science or the finance, or is this still the realm of true rocket scientists and astrophysicists and, and the really big brains in the world? No, not at all. I think this is very much open to the, uh, to the, to the you know, people like the people here that are entrepreneurs and trying to make things happen. You know, I mean, I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist, but I'm not doing this, I'm just helping it. Uh, I really envy the opportunities now, because you can build a satellite now for tens of thousands of dollars and launch it for an equivalent amount of money. Uh, that could never happen before with the, tech, with, the, with the technology we have now. We think we can, you can go to the moon uh, here in a few years uh, or less for tens of millions. That's the kind of money that Absolutely. you can raise uh, so this is very much developing that space economy and, it, and it's people like th those attending this conference that are going to do that. So, you know, you can hire the astrophysicist and rocket scientist, uh, but we need you to help develop the ideas and to sell it. So, so, so in fact, uh, one of our major payload customers is a, a private scientist, if you will, who wants to put a telescope on the, on the surface of the moon. Now, an optical telescope on the surface of the moon may not be the best science, but he has a vision for actually creating a public awareness and an educational tool. And so our first mission is going to fly a prototype of this telescope. Our second mission will, shout, will actually put one on the South Pole where it'll be permanently operational so you can use it for educational purposes. And he believes very much in the sort of uh, scientific and public awareness value of it, but I think he also believes very much in his ability to make money. Yeah. But, but it's a real commercial customer paying us for a, a a spot on the moon, if you will. Yeah. So I want to look out now the next five or ten years and just imagine a little bit. Um, what do we think are going to be the possible scenarios? I mean, is there going to be a, a someone who comes along and starts right. thinking about a privately financed trip to Mars, you know, interplanetary travel, uh, extra solar system travel? Well, let, let, let me start. I showed you the picture of Dennis Tito, right. the first space tourist. Uh, about two years ago, he actually paid NASA to help him develop a private mission to fly by Mars that we could launch by the end of this decade called Inspiration Mars. Uh, and and it, uh, we thought it would be less than a billion dollars, and there are people like him that are thinking of financing it. This would be two people 
that would fly by Mars and, and return in 500 days. Now, they were going to send a husband and wife, but uh, somebody told me that they could see what happened when they got back. The, they'd open the capsule, the husband <laughs> would be dead, the wife would be dazed and confused and wouldn't remember what happened. Uh, but uh, but none, this is real, and I think something like this is going to happen. So we're, we're, we're going to see uh, Moon Express or one of its competitors land mm -hmm. on the moon. Uh, we're going to see private missions. I think we're going to see private missions to see if there are planets around the nearby stars and, uh, and maybe even think about going there. So this is an exciting decade. Yeah. And you know, I've heard people talk about things like asteroid mining. <laughs> I mean, are we talking about the asteroids on the moon or getting to the asteroid right. belt? And is that is that a thing that's actually going to well, happen? The best place to mine an asteroid is on the moon because it's stopped and it's there and it's stationary. But let me tell you kind of like, if I look out 10 years, what I see in terms of, of our business plan is the early missions in the next few years are going to be the first couple of missions will be to the surface of the moon. And, and then I, I believe we'll be capable of winning missions in a competitive environment from NASA and other people uh, that, that Pete works with. Um, but I think as you go out, say about five years, I think at that point we start to look at some of the in-space transportation. One of the charts that Pete had up there showed the number of geosynchronous spacecraft that are out there. All of those 200 spacecraft, before they reach the end of their lifetime, actually have to move out into a supersynchronous orbit. And, and that supersynchronous orbit requires that they use about the last four to six months of their propellant to get out there. For a healthy spacecraft, one of the big ones that Pete had, those spacecraft are generating about $100 million a year in, in revenue and sales. If you can allow them to stay in orbit for another six months, and then we would provide essentially a tow truck, a disposal service, well, you've now allowed them to generate another, let's say, $50 million worth of revenue. In a single mission of our spacecraft, we have enough propulsive capability to actually do this several times, maybe three or four times. So now we're talking about generating hundreds of millions of dollars of value for a tangible customer set that is out there today at a cost basis of tens of millions of dollars. With that kind of a differential, I mean, that's what you start to build business cases that are going to fundamentally change the way we do space. Yeah. So when you're um, thinking about how to get there, I know coming back down to Earth for a second, at Ames, uh, and we talked about this uh, uh, before we got on stage, there, you're doing a lot of interesting stuff with Google now. Uh, people in Silicon Valley are aware of it, but I don't know if everyone else here would be, but you, you've struck a real interesting partnership there uh, in terms of your fees. Yeah, where Ames is, we're right in the center of Silicon Valley. There's a small startup next door called Google. Uh, and uh, when, I, when I got to Ames about nine years ago, they were just slightly bigger than we are, and they've grown more than we have. Uh, but they're a very good partner. They're very interested in space. Uh, the, uh, uh, they're interested in technology. Uh, they've looked at a lot of these space things. Uh, uh, they're considering things like uh, space constellations to take data around the Earth uh, and, and communications. But they're also interested in high-speed computing. We have today at Ames uh, one of the world's first quantum computers that we did jointly with Google. They, uh, they bought the computer and we have it at Ames and uh, it's a really good partnership. All, all I really want to emphasize Google's not our only partner, uh, but it's the kind of partnership that I think is going to take us into the solar system and eventually beyond. Uh, we're going to get, uh, you know, we're going to help them, uh, you know, achieve their objectives and, and by the way, Facebook and Microsoft and Apple have come and talked to us too, so it's good to work with one because then you work with others. Right. You, want to do, you want to do selfies from the moon eventually. So. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Exactly. It's, uh, That's it's a big to, business right there. It's good to have competition. Yeah. Um, and, and Google, I remember Vint Cerf uh, a few years ago was, ta was already uh, started some project there to talk about how do we take the internet uh, to the moon, to outer space, to Mars. Uh, yeah, Vince Cerf, who, uh, who is, uh, you know, the, the, key, of the, the, the inventor of the internet, uh, other than our former vice president, Al yes. Gore, uh, was, uh, uh, is talked about how do you do interplanetary internets? And uh, of course, you got a problem because you have light travel time. It's uh, about three seconds to the moon and it back and forth, and it's 10, 20 minutes to Mars. But he's got some ways figured out to do that. So I think by the middle of this century, we are going to see human settlements on the moon and Mars, we're going to see an interplanetary internet, we'll see a true space economy. And, and my prediction is by the, you know, 2050, it's going to be the economic engine that drives this planet. Wow. Okay. 
Um, do you agree with that? I do. Um, and in fact, one of the major drivers of that space economy it comes back to something that Pete had said earlier, water on the moon. Water on the moon is rocket fuel. The two components of water are hydrogen and oxygen. That's what you use for rocket fuel. Ultimately, the, the space economy is going to be enabled by the presence and the utilization of rocket fuel from the surface of the moon. Right now, it takes, it takes about $10,000 a kilogram to get anything off of the surface of the Earth into space. You can get it from the surface of the moon for maybe hundreds of dollars a kilogram. What that means now is things would get launched into low Earth orbit and there's going to be an in-space transportation system that's going to enable things like settlements on the moon, settlements on Mars, space-based solar power. All of that requires cheap transportation and the fundamental problem of cheap transportation is getting cheap fuel and, and the moon has an abundance of water. So we know it's there. We know this is going to work. The question is, is it going to happen in, in 10 years, 15 years? That's probably about the right kind of time frame. But that's going to be the fundamental catalyst for allowing the, the human civilization to extend itself into space. For just as a quick example, it takes about a million pounds, uh, half a million kilograms, to, to launch any kind of a serious mission to Mars. That's a lot of, $10,000 a kilogram, that's a lot of money in order to, to get something off, to get something to Mars. If you now take that sort of half a billion, or uh, it would be more like $50 billion of transportation costs, and you turn that into hundreds of millions of dollars of transportation costs, that's going to fundamentally enable us to get to Mars. Yeah. You know, the other thing I want to ask, and then we'll uh, maybe take some questions here, um, is just the awareness of this, because it's really, as interested as I am uh, in this subject, just talking to you guys the last couple of weeks, I've been surprised how much is happening now. And uh, it struck me when the Antares rocket uh, blew up the other day, I was watching uh, US television, and all the conversation was around, what, this, what does this mean for NASA? I think a lot of the public perception is still, at the end of the day, it's NASA, the European Space Agency, it's governments that are, 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 are leading the way to the extent they are or are not leading the way in all these things. And so, obviously that's not true. I mean, we saw this with the reality of who was launching that rocket and what the payloads were. We, with the things you're talking about, obviously there's a lot of stuff happening outside or in partnership with government. But how much does that perception matter? And, and is it something that you guys feel like it has to be addressed to start getting people excited and interested in, in these opportunities? Well, I think it matters a lot that people, particularly the economic community, understands that this space economy is beginning. Uh, it's going to be, I think, the biggest thing by the middle of the century. Uh, and we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, already, uh, the, the private economy is, is probably about a third to a half the size of the government space economies, and it's growing very rapidly. Uh, just kind of watch, you're going to see more and more private missions to the moon, private systems to image the Earth, uh, private systems to go to Mars. Yeah. Well, another point to just go back historically a little bit is we have the launch business, which I kind of spent the last 10 years in, has been a commercial business for about 15 years already. And the US government, the European governments have bought services from the launch industry. And that has enabled, I think, a very robust development of, of very, uh, very successful launch programs. With, and, and launches fail on occasion. Yeah. But we've been doing things commercially on the surface of the Earth. And what we're do looking at right now is actually extending that model into space. And, and Pete had talked a little bit about commercial procurement of transportation services to the space station, commercial procurement of transportation to, um, of crew to the station. And, and I think commercial transportation to the moon and other planets is just the next logical step there. Yeah. All right, can we take a few questions? Do we have a, uh, the, the Q&A thing set up? Now, I'll jump into these questions here of Slido, and the first okay. question that's absolutely burning under the nails of our audience is, do you believe in aliens, and will there be disclosure, or will this have to come from either the private sector or another government? So who believes in aliens? Please. Well, I used to be a general in the US Air Force. Uh-oh. And I guess I should know about it, but I don't know about any. But let me tell you this, if I did, 
I wouldn't have kept it secret. I'd go scare the dickens out of the Congress of the U.S. and say, look, there's these scary aliens, we need more money. Uh, and I think anybody would. And it's, uh, you know, I, I wish we had evidence of aliens, uh, but we are. I, let me tell you that, that NASA and its partners around the world are looking for aliens, but we think we're likely to find them in terms of microbes. Uh, we're looking, we're, in the next few years, we're going to look on Mars for uh, uh, microbial life, and I think there's maybe a 50-50 chance it's there. Uh, and we're going to look at other places, uh, uh, nearby stars that we now know have planets. Uh, uh, you know, that's another place to look for. So, you know, I wish we had them here today. I could scare people with them, although they're members of my staff that look like aliens, but they're not. <laughs> <laughs> so, may I conclude the U.S. Air Force has not found them in your stint? And if so, you would say, well, That's if they did, like. they didn't clear me on it. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Next question is, who does the moon belong to? And if Moon Express acts like the mining company, who does the material you bring back on Earth belong to? Okay. Uh, so the moon, the moon, by treaty, belongs to everyone and no one. It's common heritage of mankind. There are a whole series of a sort of cascading set of, of treaties, beginning with the Outer Space Treaty, um, which many nations signed to, the Lunar Treaty, which most nations that could possibly go to the moon didn't um, sign up to, uh, national legislation, national regulation. The basic gist of all of this is there's nothing which, which um, prohibits or has any effect on resource utilization. So when we talk about using the moon for developing um, rocket fuel, there, there's nothing out in the legal sphere, and believe me, the legal, there, there are enough space lawyers to fill this room thinking about this kind of stuff. There's nothing out there that suggests that kind of activity is prohibited anyway. So I, in terms of, if you're using stuff in space, it's all very clear. If, if you're extracting resources, that seems to be very clear as well. Where it starts to get into areas where you might be able to look at, at some treaties or regulations, that, that are a little bit more contentious, that's in claiming land. And, and the, the treaties say that nations, the, the Lunar Treaty says that nations cannot claim parts of the moon for their own as nations. It's silent on the issue of commercial entities. Um, but the United States, Russia, China, almost any nation that's capable of sending a mission to the moon didn't sign the treaty. So it's kind of a questionable piece of international legislation. So no one really knows, essentially, at this point. Well, I mean, someone, someone told me once that where explorers go, lawyers follow at a respectable distance. And we would like to keep that distance respectable. But make the second rocket very expensive. Right. Okay, out of all what is shown here, was developed 20 years ago, someone claims. So how about something you're working on right now? Well, I guess I disagree with that. Good. Uh, the, uh, I do have some other pictures, but we are working on uh, a, a mission that we think can be privately funded that can image planets around the nearest star, Alpha Centauri A and B. Uh, we think that could be launched in a couple years. Uh, the, uh, we are looking at uh, small satellites that can find if there's life on the big moon of, uh, uh, one of the big moons of Jupiter, Europa. And, and I think, of course, the Moon Express is, uh, is uh, an example of somebody that's going to go to the moon. There are other companies that are going to do asteroid mining experiments in the next few years. So all of this is happening very quickly. I have a w one private question. Who, also of you, raise your hand, who believes in aliens? I'm curious. You don't believe in aliens? Alien uh, microbes. Alien microbes. Who else? Okay, fair enough. That was good to know. What quantity of resource, resources could be brought from the moon back here before we disrupt our two planetary mechanisms, Earth and Moon orbits. Oh my. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> A lot more than, we're, that, than anybody is capable of bringing. I mean, if you're, ta you're talking about trillions and trillions of tons of mass of the moon. And, and so in order to affect that, you would have to be bringing back in any meaningful way, you'd have to be bringing back a huge amount of resources. And I, that, I think that for the near term, the moon will be used for developing the in-space economy 
not so much for bringing things back to the Earth. I think there may be some opportunities for small sort of novelty missions bringing things back. And that's a beautiful way to get to the second question here is, what new opportunities do you identify for startups in the space sector? What's, what's there to go for? Well, well I, th I think that's, a, you know, that's exactly the, we, we try to give you a flavor of it. Uh, one of the biggest things is the small satellites that uh, like uh, Planet Labs, the previous discussion, that's a huge opportunity for startups. There are at least 10 startup companies uh, uh, that I know of, uh, many of them in our research park, doing these small satellites. That's an amazing opportunity. Another one which we didn't talk about is space biology. Uh, and the opportunities to study changes uh, in biology and space, one of the things that we learned in the last few years is gene expression differs in space for reasons we don't understand. This is another way to get at the fundamental mechanisms of life. So a second area is to do synthetic biology, bioengineering. Uh, it's really the key to getting us uh, uh, on another world because what you really want is a programmable self-replicating machine. That's called biology. And that also has a lot of applications on Earth. The third one I already mentioned was 3D printing, uh, doing, uh, you know, building things in space. It's called massless exploration. All of these are things that I think there's a lot of opportunities. Thank you. The vision is more and more satellites, but space trash will be a huge problem. How will we solve it? It's a real opportunity for startups or rather a government concern. Who will regulate that? This is, this is an interesting area because space debris really is an emerging problem. There are certain orbits where we're very close to reaching a critical mass of debris where if we had, say, one additional collision of two large objects, we could potentially render a, an orbital band largely useless. So it's, it's a significant concern. The question is, what is the economic mechanism that would um, justify this kind of activity? Our spacecraft, for example, could, I think, quite easily move um, uh, satellites that have died, um, spent upper stages, we could easily move them either into uh, essentially an Earth descent trajectory so they burn up in the atmosphere or to a more benign orbit, but the economic mechanism isn't there to pay us to do it. And I think this is something that needs to be developed probably through international agreement, but it's, it's a market that potentially for us, I mean, we're in the business of making money, and it's a market that looks very interesting but unfortunately we need to come up with a, and, and certainly technically it's very solvable. As I said, with, with one launch, I think we could probably remove several pieces of orbital debris. Um, we need to come up with some sort of intergovernmental agreement that would create the economic mechanism, the economic incentive, somebody to pay us to do it. Okay, thank you. And maybe I'll, take, I'll choose the last question. One wants to know where Elon Musk is. Well, Elon, Elon Musk, so, so, Okay, where is Elon Musk? Why have we got Elon Musk here? Okay, no one wants to answer that. But here's another question is, everyone's talking about the moon, why not focus on Mars? Let, let, let me answer Please. that because uh, we have that argument all the time. Moon, Mars, moon, Mars, asteroids. Uh, we're doing all of those. You know, whenever you're given a choice, take all of them. Uh, and I think that uh, NASA's ultimate objective is to enable people to go to Mars. Uh, the, the moon is also on our job jar, uh, and so are the asteroids. So I think it's a fake uh, question. Uh, we're going to do all of them. Trust me.